good afternoon. I can't see any of you, but I trust you're there. Uh, I'm John Budd. I am uh, an EVP at Sonic. I'm in charge of strategy and overall technology. Good afternoon. I'm Brandon Burke, and I have the privilege of serving as our vice president of technology architecture and development. So I came to Sonic five years ago from Boston Consulting Group. I'm a strategist. I'm not a technologist. Um, I guess in the parlance of what we just went through earlier this afternoon, uh, you're the geek. I'm the geek translator. So uh, that's kind of the role that we play as we work Make through this. Make a good things. team. Yes. So Sonic is an American brand. And if you're not from the US, you may not know our brand at all. Uh, we are the largest restaurant company that is only in one country. Uh, we're only in the United States. We're working on that, but right now we're just an American brand. So I wanted to take a few minutes and just talk a little bit about what our brand is. We were founded 65 years ago as Top Hat. Uh, we introduced an order speaker system. So they, we were one of the first companies to use that audio process to allow customers to, uh, to order from their cars. And then we could provide service at the speed of sound. We changed the name to Sonic in 1959. And now we are the largest uh, chain of drive-ins in the world. But many of you have never seen a drive-in, uh, let alone a Sonic. This is what it looks like. And uh, it's important to understand the service model. So let me take a moment to just go through this. Uh, you see here, cars will drive in and park. You see menu housings alongside each car. Um, those, those parking spots are called stalls. And you, uh, you actually see a digital screen on each stall, right? And that's a, a point of purchase uh, display that we have. Um, it's important you understand that you'll see why in a bit. But basically, that's what a Sonic drive-in looks like. We are uh, known as a burger, quick service restaurant. We really have a very diverse menu, though. We have chicken. Uh, we're very much known for our drinks, our shakes. Uh, we, we have hot dogs. And really, we really do have a, an extraordinarily complex menu for quick service. These are our two guys. Uh, even if you live in Canada, you may see them creep over the border on uh, advertisements. And we want to show you a little bit of our advertising. Ta -ta -ta -ta. What are you doing? I'm enjoying the American classical. It's the American classic. Double the beef. Uh, double the cheese. Double the smile. Give me that. This cookie jar shake is like the perfect marriage of Oreo cookies and real ice cream. Now that's a wedding I would kill to go to. Sure, at it now. Should I get a speech? No. <laughs> I've known ice cream since college. I like those Balenciagas, the ones that look like socks. I like going to the Tula. I put rocks all in my watch. I can't believe they still hand make the onion rings. Oh, then you're going to love this. It's yeah. hand folded. Oh, it's a swan. Oh. It's a napkin, dude. Body banging, body spicy, mommy, hot tamale, hotter than a Molly, Burr, Cole, Burr, Peter Piper picked a pack of perfect pretzels. Hold up. Your last name is Piper? Chat. Chat. OK, so we have a very irreverent brand. Uh, those two guys you see are extraordinarily well-paid uh, individuals. They're improv comedians that got a gig at Sonic 10 years ago, and they've been a really big part of our brand. Our ICE vision, first of all, ICE to us is integrated customer engagement. Uh, our ICE vision is to be the most personalized QSR, quick service restaurant in America. And we, we feel that we're already there, but, but it's been a long journey over the last few years. So the first thing we had to do about five years ago, we had extraordinarily old point of sale systems and uh, technology at headquarters. We had to upgrade our point of sale system. This pop screen you see in the center here, that's a digital screen. And then we had to refresh or retrofit our drive-ins to kind of bring them up to code, if you will. Now, let me talk a little bit about this pop screen. That is something we can program uh, media to from our headquarters. There are 90,000 of these endpoints now. It's certainly one of the largest point of purchase uh, networks, uh, I'm sure, in the world. And we have the ability to individually address those, which is really an amazing capability. Uh, this all leads to something we, we call the 2020 drive-in. Around the year 2020, we're trying to, to really modernize what is a very retro brand. We had some challenges, uh, as most companies do. We had this great vision. And everything you've seen so far in the other presentations has been about the importance of personalization and relevance. We know that's important. We knew that many years ago. So we had this great vision. The challenge really comes in execution. When I joined Sonic in 2013, uh, as an X strategy consultant, one of the first things I did was a gap analysis. So why is this not proceeding at the pace that we really wanted it to? And it really came down to uh, three things. We didn't have any dedicated resources to roll out the hardware. We didn't have any OPEX. And we didn't have a cross-functional plan. So 
you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? That's an American joke. I thought I wasn't sure if it translated <laughs> over the border. Okay. <laughs> so uh, really, you know, you, you, without these things, without taking a step back, by trying to, to do these things as part of the ordinary course of business, um, we really were struggling with the execution. So uh, we had our first major reset at that point in time to really take a step back, start putting resources dedicated against this rollout, um, get some funding to pay for those resources, and then really build that multi-year plan to, uh, to do the hardware upgrade. We are now near 100% completion of this hardware upgrade, um, which really enables us to do the great stuff we're going to talk about in terms of personalization. So this 2020 drive-in is really about fostering integrated customer engagement. You see our pop screens, social, CRM, and mobile all working together to provide that really customized uh, consumer experience. Brandon. So one of the things that maybe it's obvious, but given our business model, it's worth, worth reminding we're 95% franchised, which means that each one of those franchisees, that's their livelihood, that's their investment for their future. And so we always talk about our technology approach it, that we want to be very clear, we're not trying to adopt the latest and greatest. We're not trying to be cool uh, and do voice ordering or chat bots or anything else that may come up just for the sake of, of doing it because it's what's in the news. And that's really important to our business and our franchisees. So these are not the goals of our technology component of our ICE vision. And it's not necessarily that we won't be leading edge, but it'll always be in service to the business. What it does mean, however, is that whatever we do is processed through this lens of how will this help us personalize our me in a meaningful way to the guests? And will it deliver a consistent brand experience that our customers, many of them lifetime customers in a 65-year-old brand that they have come to expect? Or will it be radically different? And if it is radically different, how will we change their experience over time to get them used to that new technology? OK, so these are my PowerPoint skills you'll, you'll see in a second here. What I'm trying to illustrate here, uh, there's a lot of move towards mobile ordering in our business, people ordering off-premises and then picking up on-premises, similar to what you do in a lot of retail. So this box here represents a, a traditional drive through quick service restaurant. Could be a McDonald's, a Burger King, or whatever. You have the place where the consumer orders at the back of the house. You have the payment window and then the pickup window. So that's just the, kind of the setup for this. Uh, this is a, a drive through queue. And uh, when our competitors really try to uh, manage this off-premises ordering, they struggle for a pretty, maybe not obvious reason, but once I sh show this to you, I think it'll be intuitive. You may have a customer who just ordered at the order post, uh, right ahead of somebody who ordered on the mobile phone. You may have a giant group order that was on the mobile phone halfway through the queue. You have somebody that's waiting at the order post, doesn't know what he wants. And you have uh, basically somebody at the end of the line that just wants a drink. So the business, it's very hard to serve this variety of business in a serial uh, uh, sort of pa uh, fashion. So what we would say is when we look at this picture, we say it's really hard to know how these customers are going to get their food uh, at the right temperature and for that to be the right order. And in this case, it'd be nice to have some stalls. right? So this is why we feel, as we think about order ahead, and the future of relevance and personalization in the restaurant industry, we think this old retro service model from 65 years ago is really ideally suited to serve this business. If you think about it, customer just orders off-premises or on-premises, pulls into a stall, checks in, we bring the food out when it's ready. It's, very, it's a very subtle difference between a drive through and a drive-in, but we see that we have a clear advantage. The world has kind of come back around to this. It's like a click and collect business but one that was created 65 years ago. So in the old Sonic experience, you would basically have somebody imagine they wanted to come to our restaurant and then work, come to the restaurant, go through menu review, order, payment, and then wait for the food. That is about 11 minutes of time on premises. When we think about where we are now, as we move towards order ahead, basically the guest can do all of those things except for order delivery off-premises, which means, first of all, uh, the guest is much more in control of the experience. Secondly, we can turn those stalls over much more quickly. So we've reaped a lot of benefits already from this order ahead process. Now, we had another challenge. And uh, Brandon and I uh, struggled through this. And this was the legacy 
IT structure that we had. It wasn't that it was bad. It was that we as a company weren't really thinking about ourselves as a technology-led strategy company. So what we had is a great mobile app that we bought off the shelf, if you will. Um, it worked for basic functionality, uh, but, but didn't have the ability to customize that we needed. The second thing we had, if you see this, is just a bunch of legacy systems which we had invested in over time, and they were all basically tied to each other. And if you just think mathematically, if I take this as my technology ecosystem, and I want to add one more system to it, I have to integrate it to eight different things, right? So that's very slow, that's very difficult to do, it's not very flexible. So we did our second major reset here. We went out and invested in our own app, customized for our purposes, and then we began to work with ThoughtWorks on what we call our digital innovation platform. And that's essentially just a hub that everything can hook into, and Brandon's gonna talk a little bit more about, about the technology side of this thing, but it, what it has really allowed us to do is innovate and move much more quickly as a business. So as John mentioned, we took this time, and this is part of our, some of the takeaways we'll go through here in a few moments, the lessons learned. This is a multi-year um, ICE vision that we've been executing upon. I think it really started to come to life in 2010, 11 timeframe. A lot of technology decisions started being made in 2012, 2013. And so <clears throat> as, as all of you have probably experienced, we had plenty of legacy systems to try to leverage, to try to uh, capitalize upon and we had certain constraints. And as we looked after the first couple of years of executing on the technical strategy that was really the, the traditional approach of project by project, what are the milestones, what are the program deliverables this year, this quarter, things that we could say we checked the box, we delivered this capability this year, this fiscal year, uh, the board was pleased with the results. The, we could tell the franchisees that these features were coming and would operate in their drive-in, but really, what we saw was we weren't really achieving the outcome of this integrated customer engagement vision. And we didn't see that changing any time in the, in the future. So we, as part of this reset, we took a step back and we really assessed objectively how we were approaching this work and realized it was a common approach. And perhaps, luckily, it's common to most of our competitors. And so we looked at that and we thought, well, what do we need to do differently? We have an opportunity, which you seldom get, to reset in a big program. And so we decided that's when we, we would really look for some, some thought leadership. We engaged a few different folks, including ThoughtWorks, as, as one of our main thought leaders in this area. And they helped us to appreciate that we had established this these unique creatures, if you will. We had this unintegrated architecture, and each one of these things met the business need at the time. It wasn't that they didn't work um, in their own merit, but they weren't built on any shared principles. They weren't built on any sort of shared uh, technology underpinning thought process, and they were built by different teams over many years that had come and gone, and so we had a lack of real ability to support and secure and scale these things as we look forward multiple years of, of this vision that we saw of personalizing our guests' experience. And so we said, hey, what do we need to do differently? And that's when we really stepped into this, this discussion of platform thinking. And this is something that I'm sure is a, is a topic in all of your organizations, but we decided that platform thinking or a platform mindset, which is not just about technology, it's also about organizational design, responsibilities of teams and people, creating a culture, to use the, the, the overloaded de facto word now of DevOps, how we would need to actually change our culture and organize around these initiatives in a different way. And it's by doing this type of work that we put all of our chips on the table and said this is how we're going to move out of the common pack and set ourselves up with other brands that over a five, six, seven year period, we had noticed, had built a reputation uh, with customers that you could use these brands' technology and they were forward thinking. They weren't always on the money. They didn't, they didn't always experiment with something that stuck, but customers were used to seeing their technology in apps and web and social. And so we wanted to be noticed like that by our guests. And so this platform approach was the way that we decided to do that. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, not to go into the nuts and bolts because that's not what today's all about, but really it was about rebuilding from scratch Greenfields, a new, complete new cloud-based platform that really took all the core business capabilities, things that had existed for 60 plus years, and 
determined how to unlock them in a, in a way that is well integrated, that does, does not disrupt a restaurant's operations, but can make it easily extendable to each digital channel, including our, our large channel, Pops, that John mentioned earlier, over 90,000 of these digital screens running across the United States. That's a, a cornerstone of our digital strategy that our competitors would, will struggle to match that multi-screen experience. And so we already have seen through this type of platform mindset, continuous deployment of business value, we're shipping, we're shipping new features to production almost five days a week now, which was unheard of in 2013, 2014, during the first few years of our, our execution on the ICE vision. And so the business is seeing the results, including security. Because as a restaurant brand that serves about two million people a day, there's a lot of payments, there's a lot of personal information. Uh, we're a high profile target, as most of you probably are in your organizations for data theft. And so this is a growing concern and it's skyrocketed in parallel over the last five years. We've already tested new things, of course, because they're cool and fun and us geeks like to test these things out. But you know, what we're really excited about is not necessarily the Amazon Echo, but whatever that next opportunity is, we're poised to respond to and capture it. John, you want to speak to some of these benefits? So what this has allowed us to do is really move faster to market, experiment responsibly, and deliver a consistent customer experience. I want to just take a second to describe what we can do that really no other quick service restaurant can do. If somebody orders ahead at Sonic, they pull in to our restaurant, they check in, we actually have the ability to pair that POPS device with the mobile app and welcome the customer by name. There's literally no other quick service restaurant that can do that. We also can uh, enable our car hops to know the customer's name. We are the only place, uh, unless you're a regular, where you could be welcomed by name. The car hop will say, I'm Brooklyn, uh, welcome back, here's your supersonic breakfast burrito. There is, no other, there is no other restaurant company in our space that can do that. Now, you could say Starbucks can recognize you by name, but basically they recognize you by name by holding up a cup and calling out your name to the entire restaurant. That is not the sort of personalization that we're really looking for. A anybody have that experience, right? Had your name messed up? Have you had to touch somebody else's uh, cup in order to find yours? These are the sorts of things that we avoid with the, uh, with the service model that we have. What that all leads to is higher sales and profits. And when we said this at our convention, we shared this with our operators, this is an applause line. These are small business people who really don't care that much about the underlying technology. They just want it to work, and they just want it to make more money, and that's what we're seeing. Yeah, and I'll just underscore to put a fine point on that experiment responsibly line. We heard a lot this morning discussed in multiple talks about failure and how we as a, as a culture and our organization respond to that word. And is it in, in response to learning or is it as something punitive that, that people are fearful of or shamed by? And so that's been a culture change as well. We are no different. We're a successful, a long-standing brand and our, our franchisee community, they expect things to work reliably every time because it's their business. And so that was a point that we had to learn throughout the last several years through anyone going through this digital journey of, of moving their physical business into the digital world, letting consumers interact in a self-service way when they're not on premises. This was something that took a lot of business level conversations with our franchisees to help them understand the benefits and also how we would help them recover and in these experiments so that we could move forward, take the learnings, and we looked for those more entrepreneurial and open franchisees to help us through that process. So that's a good takeaway. We're in Oklahoma City, which is not a major city in the United States, in the middle of America. Probably some of you have never heard of Oklahoma City other than maybe the Oklahoma City Thunder, but we really are doing big things there. Um, this chart shows you how quickly we were able to roll out order ahead this summer. Uh, we did a, f a couple months of piloting, but uh, as you can see, starting in about end of May to end of August, we rolled this out across our entire system. Only with that digital innovation platform, that ability to integrate quickly, release uh, software quickly, could we do this. In fact, what was interesting is while in the past technology was often the long pole in the tent, in this case, we were able to roll out, we could have rolled the technology out more quickly. The, the long pole in the tent here was really training our employees at 3,600 locations. So to go from you know, three years to roll out hardware to three months to roll out uh, a major innovation in our chain is just an amazing, uh, amazing transformation for our company. 
And so as part of that process, as John just showed you that graph that showed over just a few months, uh, a full rollout at scale, 3,600 locations, millions of guests still ordering their food every day. We're processing tens of thousands of order head transactions every day now, real revenue per minute. And so with that mindset, those were things that we baked into our platform. So when we think about the technology strategy that comes from platform thinking, every single API, every single application, the mobile, the web, the text, the SMS, all the channels, they all inherited observability. And what that gives us is an assurance and a confidence that our system is scaling, which in the past, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of uh, late nights and weekends with those various bespoke systems that were wired together loosely over years. And so now we feel really confident that we can assure these kinds of customer experience uh, um, service level targets of three seconds or less to pay for their order to check in. And in many cases, in fact, the average times is it's near real time that customer presses the button on their phone, they look at that pop screen, and it says, welcome back, Brandon. So it's amazing to see that work as we continue to drive volume. And really the message to take away from that for us as we continue to, to educate and advocate for how we're stewarding the resources we have for our franchisee business is that we're ready for growth. We've built this thing very rapidly and we are ready not only to take on an immense amount of order ahead type transactions on the technology, while we put the full force of the sonic marketing machine behind it here in the coming months, but also all the new things that we're ready to respond to. I heard Pokemon Go mention this morning, whatever that next new idea is, whether it's a, a flash in the pan, we feel really confident that we can actually capitalize on that and, and ride that wave if we so choose to. So I want to wrap up with some lessons learned. Uh, the first one is really, it's important to continually reassess your programs. And sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. I can tell you that when I went to my boss uh, nearly five years ago and said, we, we really have to reset this whole thing. Um, it was not a pleasant conversation, but it was one that had to happen. You uh, saw Craig Miller here on the stage not long ago. Uh, Craig and I had to basically partner with others in the organization to rebuild our entire program. And then a couple years later on the software side, we had to do the same thing. But we would not be where we are now had we not had the self-confidence to say, this isn't working, we need to try something different. Um, we haven't talked about funding so far. I wanted to touch upon it here. These programs are expensive. We are not a big company. Uh, we have 3,600 stores, but we only own 5% of them. So finding the funds to do a program like this was challenging. Uh, in this case, we had to turn over every rock. The first thing we did to help us with the hardware was we went out to vendors. Uh, we, we sell a lot of Coca-Cola, a lot of Dr. Pepper, these sorts of vendors that could market on those screens that you saw and tell them it was in their interest to help us fund that because it's more ways that they can market their product. We had to go to our franchisees at a later stage and say we need additional funds in order to, to fund the software development. Now, franchisees uh, don't give away money easily, so that we were able to convince them that really to fund cybersecurity protection, they needed to fund that. Beyond that, um, that was as far as they were willing to go. But then we said, okay, so what if we go out and negotiate lower food costs on chicken and beef and some other things? Can we take some of those savings and instead of passing them back to the franchisee, can we apply them against the technology investment? And almost shockingly, that was okay. The franchisees agreed to fund the, the initiative in that way. And really without those creative uh, uses of funds, um, we, would, we would not be where we are. Yeah, and the last point, and this is one that we all likely spend a lot of our discussions every day on, and that's, we use the word prioritize here, but we could easily call it, uh, we could also call it experimentation. You know, really what we learned here is whenever we as an organization were able to cut scope, limit the, the size of the project from multiple years to multiple months to multiple weeks, make small bets, get them live, cut scope and go live, that we have been more and more successful. And so it's, it's not a new theory. We've all heard it many times that it's easier said than done. And, but we see that over and over again. And so this is definitely something that uh, we use a lot in our language now over the last 18, 24 months, ruthless prioritization. Because really, we pivoted just in the springtime on order ahead. We had some core assumptions baked into our roadmaps that we were going to be building software on that were quickly invalidated. And we, we moved directions. And if we hadn't done that, we would still be trying to launch order ahead today. 
Okay, we uh, appreciate your being patient with us as we go through the history of our company. It's really exciting to be here, and it's even more exciting to be where we are in our technology journey. So thank you for your time today.